So <clears throat> today we're starting a, a new topic, and uh, this might be another shortage lecture, we'll see. Uh, but the, the topic is optical cavities. And uh, Fabry Perot is the French name, which I'm probably mispronouncing, associated with these, these kind of cavities. And there's uh, some technology and some definitions and some physics, and, and I'll try to get to all those. And we'll build up the actual uh, kind of spherical mirror laser cavities and uh, analysis cavities that uh, that are universally used. But, but before we get there, and before we return back to incorporating Gaussian beams in these cavities and, and asking questions about stability and other things, uh, I, I want to just work on the very simplest situation. And, and we'll, we'll sort of lay down some of the definitions in, in this very simple case. So, so the simplest case, simplest situation is plane mirrors, plane mirrors, uh, perfect reflection. So uh, today I'm gonna to talk about plane mirrors with perfect reflection and plane mirrors with imperfect reflection, sort of some loss or some leak leakage out of the cavity. Uh, and then in the future, we'll talk about uh, other shapes of mirrors. So the idea is you have a, a cavity and it has some, some distance between the mirrors D. And in a laser, this is, you know, this can be uh, like the lasers we have in lab, this is around 30 centimeters, you know, so maybe 15 centimeters, 15 centimeters one, one way, 30 centimeters round trip. Um, but on, uh, on semiconductor lasers, like laser pointer type lasers, the, the cavity is, is made of the front and back surfaces of the chip. And so D is, is much smaller, sort of on the order of uh, millimeters or, or less. Uh, but the idea with these cavities and, and in this, in this uh, perfect reflection regime, you can imagine light bouncing back and forth here. And I'll, I'll, I'll think about this two ways. One is kind of a particle of light bouncing back and forth and picking up a certain phase as it does that. And then secondly, we'll actually look at the real solutions to Maxwell's equations and we'll think in terms of waves. So just in terms of the, the, the particle, particle situation, if you start at one side and go to the other side and back, in order to get constructive interference, in order for that little sort of imaginary particle of light to be bouncing back and forth, accumulating phase, if, if, you, uh, if you want constructive interference, when you get back to where you start, you have to have the same phase as where you left. And so there's a, there's a condition to get constructive interference. So for constructive interference, You have to go back and forth, so that's 2D. And this has to equal some integer number of wavelengths. So Q is some integer, lowercase q. Um, it has to equal some integer number of wavelengths, lambda. And, and Q, Q can be one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. You get, uh, you get constructive interference in this cavity. Um, and so you can solve for lambda here. So let me call it lambda Q, so the Qth uh, wavelength that can fit in here is going to be 2D over Q. Uh, and these are all, these are the possible, possible resonant, resonant wavelengths. So uh, there's, there's another way of analyzing this. Let me switch pens here. And that's to say, um, with if we make the definition that we often do here, that k is two pi over lambda. So this is the k is called the wave number. It's, it's sort of like the you know the length equivalent of omega. Um, then the, the equivalent condition here becomes that two d times k 
equals, you want this to be a, uh, so this is the amount of phase that is picked up after going around trip is the distance times a wave number. You want this to be an integer number of, uh, integer multiple of two pi. And this similarly implies that K, the Qth K is pi over D times Q. So because lambda and K are inverses of each other, K, K has the, the integer in the, in the numerator. Um, let me do it one more way, which is to look at the frequency. So the frequency, which I'll, in optics is usually called nu, the Greek letter nu. This is speed of light over lambda. So nu is in Hertz. And uh, if, if we now solve this top equation here, then uh, we, we see that two, 2d equals some integer q times c over, uh, oh, sorry, c over nu. Uh, so I got this backwards. I want to solve for, solve for lambda and plug it in. So let me do it in two steps so I don't confuse myself here. All right, if I just solve for lambda, lambda is going to be uh, c, c over nu. And if I plug that in here, I get 2d equals q c over nu. And now if I solve for nu, nu equals c over 2d times q. All right, so, so what's nicer about thinking in terms of frequency as opposed to thinking in terms of lambda is this, the spacing of the modes. So if I were to draw the modes in, in terms of lambdas here, uh, let me make it not line up with the cavity. Okay, so, so if this is if this is lambda, and I ask what are the valid modes? Well, when Q is one, there's there's a mode at two D. So I'll just draw a little bar there at two D. When Q is two, there's a mode at one D. So there's D, and then there's a mode at uh, 2d over 3, so 2 thirds, 2 thirds d, and it, it sort of gets denser and denser and denser and denser, all the, all the valid wavelengths. So, so this sort of makes sense. If you, if you imagine in the wave picture fitting, fitting uh, some integer number of waves going backwards and forwards, um, as you add more and more and more waves, the, the wavelength shrinks. But if if you've got very few waves, the wavelength has to shrink a lot in order to fit one more mode. If you've got a lot of modes in there already, uh, you know, uh, a lot of wavelengths in there already, to add one more, you don't have to shrink very much. And so even though it makes a lot of conceptual sense to think about these cavities in terms of wavelengths and, uh, and think about adding one more wavelength, oftentimes we don't talk in terms of wavelengths because the, the spacing for the wavelengths is not is not very nice. Um, usually, cavities, people who work with cavities are often working with optical frequencies, which we haven't talked much about because these are usually ten to the fourteen hertz, some some huge number. Uh, and the uh, what's nice about working in terms of frequencies, though, is if you plot, make the same plot in terms of frequency. There's some. Some modes, but they're they're evenly spaced in frequency, and then they keep going on. So the spacing between the modes. Let me see if I have enough room here. Yeah, I think I do. Spacing between the modes is just the number that multiplies this integer. So c c over two d, and this. This has a name. It's called the, the free spectral range. So this is called F S R, the free spectral range. And the, the name of this name will make a little bit more sense as we as we talk about some applications to cavities. But it's basically the the distance you have to go in frequency in order to fit one more mode into the cavity. And I think that um, 
historically in when people have done labs involving these this cavity, I would say that um, everyone's natural inclination is to think in terms of wavelengths and think of adding one more wavelength. And, and that certainly is a nice physical picture. But the problem is that the, the spacing in terms of wavelengths isn't, isn't as clean as the spacing in terms of frequencies. And so even though we don't normally think about optical frequencies, um, it, it helps to think in, as, uh, in terms of these integer number of, of frequencies. So these the little spikes here on either plot are the, the valid, uh, valid wavelengths or valid frequencies where you get constructive interference. Um, so, so oftentimes we work in terms of uh, frequency and especially in terms of delta frequency. So this free spectral range here is a type of, uh, it's a type of delta nu. It's a spacing between, between modes here. And, uh, and this, the spacing between modes for reasonable size cavities ends up being gigahertz which is uh, you know, 10 to the nine Hertz. It's sort of a reasonable, more reasonable number, but uh, the actual frequency is 10 to the 14 Hertz. So there's a factor of uh, uh, what, 10,000 10, difference, or uh, 100,000 difference there uh, between the optical frequencies and the spacing between valid modes. Um, all right. so. Let's, this was all sort of in terms of, you know, just thinking about maybe a particle bouncing back and forth and accumulating some phase and asking for constructive interference. Let's actually focus more on the wave picture uh, and, and sort of see where, where these similar, uh, similar expressions come from when we, when we think about it in terms of waves. So I'm gonna erase just this top stuff because I'm gonna compare it to, these things down here. And let me just say for applications of these cavities, um, I, I keep hinting at hinting at lasers. And uh, even though the, the mirrors on a laser cavity are curved to contain the light within the cavity, as opposed to these flat mirrors, which will often sort of let things leak out. Um, the, the math to, to, to get the mode spacing is very similar. So uh, when we ask, what is the spectrum of a laser? Ultimately, the, the narrowness of the laser spectrum comes from the fact that only these discrete constructive modes can, can exist and constructively interfere within the cavity. Uh, all right, so, so let's, let's actually write down a solution to Maxwell's equations. And, and show where, where the boundary conditions enforce a very similar thing. So, so we saw that Maxwell's equations are linear. And so uh, in free space, we know that a plane wave is a perfectly valid solution. So is a Gaussian beam, but for, for flat mirrors, a plane wave is much easier to work with. So our, our E plus as a function of Z here, let's let this be the Z axis. Um, this is just some, some overall constant amplitude, which we almost never worry about absolute units of, e to the i kz. And we'll see that in order to satisfy the boundary conditions here, k is going to have to take on certain values. Um, so so let's, let's impose boundary conditions where the electric field vanishes at the conductive mirrors on either side. So, so uh, boundary conditions, boundary conditions where e e of zero has to be zero, and also e at the distance d equals zero. So, let me just make my origin here of the z-axis there. Um, okay. So, so what is what is a valid solution? Well, because Maxwell's equations are linear, this solution by itself can never satisfy these boundary conditions, right? No matter, no matter what Z I put in, this has unit magnitude. And so if I were to demand that this solution by itself satisfy these boundary conditions, I would have to say that the amplitude is zero everywhere. And that's, that's not particularly useful. 
So what we want to look for is superpositions of these plane wave solutions that satisfy the boundary conditions. So we'll let, let the, the actual um, plane wave we're interested in, or sorry, that's not a plane wave anymore. We'll let the actual uh, solution we're interested in be a superposition. So let E be some A E to the positive I K Z and some B E to the minus I K Z. And we can impose these boundary conditions here. So, so at, at E equals zero, what, what do we get? We get uh, just A plus B equals zero. All right, great. So, so now, now that implies that, that B is negative A, say, or A is negative B. So I can factor out A e to the I K Z minus E to the minus I KZ. It says that the amplitudes of the two components are the same in order to satisfy the boundary condition at zero. And the boundary condition at D um, gives us gives us what? Well, this, this says that uh, the amplitude of E to the I K D minus E to the minus I K D. Uh, let, sorry, let me let me take a let me take a step in an opposite order here. So let me let me write this in terms of uh, sines and cosines. So remember e to the i. Uh, let me just erase the title here. So I I often don't have these at the tip of my my uh, my fingers, but I do remember Euler's formula. So e to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta and e to the minus i theta that is just the negative of this. So cosine is even, cos theta sine is odd minus i sine theta. What do I have here? I have e to the positive something minus e to the minus something. So if I were to take these things and subtract them, subtract these things, I get e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. And this is that minus that or two i sine sine theta. So what, what we see here is that this, uh, this is just a times two i sine of uh, kz. Okay, and, and the boundary condition here where the electric field has to vanish at this wall implies that sine, sine of KD has to equal zero, because again, this amplitude can't equal zero, otherwise it's always zero everywhere and for all time. And that's not an interesting solution. And this, this implies that K KD equals some integer multiple of pi. So Q, Q times pi. You can see if I solve for K, I get, I get exactly what we got before just by uh, sort of intuitive adding up of phases. So, so here's the, the kind of wave, wave equation way of establishing that, that these are the valid modes. And uh, yeah, all right. So, let me pause there. The next, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to consider mirrors that aren't perfectly reflective. So either there's some loss or some some damping, and uh, and there we we really have to sort of go focus on the the wave the wave aspect. And what we'll find is that the the solutions for the electric field aren't quite as clean. They aren't they aren't signs with absolutely definite frequencies. Um, it will turn out that other other frequencies are allowed. They just have different different amplitudes. So let me uh, see if anybody has any questions. I will start erasing 
Uh, let's see what I want to erase. I'll erase from the top here. So the spectrum, let me just, as I'm erasing, I'll review here. The spectrum of the cavity with perfectly conducting mirrors is a spectrum that looks like this in terms of wavelength. It's a bunch of spikes. You know, you can think of them as delta functions. Either, either the uh, wavelength is allowed or it's, it's not at all allowed and nothing in, nothing in between. If you try to put a wave uh, with a frequency in between, it doesn't satisfy the boundary conditions. If you try to inject a wave with a frequency in between, you won't get constructive interference, you'll get destructive interference. Okay. So, yeah, let me just erase half and I'll come back and erase the other half after. All right, so the, the, the new situation that we're going to consider, I'll keep this picture here. I'll get rid of my nice sine wave here. The new situation we're going to consider is some loss or uh, sometimes called damp, damping. So this is a wave that's bouncing back and forth, but um, not 100% of the wave makes it back to where, where it started. So let me just imagine some you know, kind of a particle picture where it bounces off this cavity, comes back, bounces off that cavity, and returns. For a perfectly lossless cavity with lossless mirrors, that's what we considered. If, if a cavity has losses, then we have to modify our, our math a little bit. And where do losses come from? Well, one obvious thing is that no mirror is perfect. The mirrors that, that we have in, in lab for our real laser cavities are, are maybe 99% or 99.9% .9 reflective. They're pretty good. Um, and where do the losses come from? Well, either uh, there's some absorption in the mirrors. The light just gets absorbed on the mirrors because the, the metal has some finite resistance. It's not a superconductor. Uh, you know, any little dirt or imperfection certainly absorb light. Um, usually dirt or imperfections don't, don't just absorb, but they scatter light out. So occasionally some light will, will hit, hit here and it'll, it'll just leave the cavity. Um, in a real laser, one of these mirrors is a little bit less transparent on purpose to let, let some light out. Um, in, a, in an analyzing cavity, one of the mirrors has to be not perfect to let the light in to be analyzed. And uh, also the finite size of the mirror. So so the, when we talk about lasers, the, there are spherical mirrors at the end, but they're actually really tiny. They're just a super tiny, like, you know, a, a few millimeter piece of a, a sphere uh, and, and light can, can leak around them and, and get lost that way. So there's lots of different sources of loss. And we're not gonna try to quantify all of them, but we're, what, we, what we are gonna do is we're gonna kind of come up with a framework for saying, you know, in general, given some amount of loss, what, what do the valid modes look like and what does the spectrum look like? So what we're gonna say here in this round trip, our assumption for lossless cavities is that the, the magnitude of the electric field on the n plus first trip is gonna be r, the magnitude of r, some, some uh, some ratio here times the electric field on the nth trip. And because these are both complex numbers, R, R, can, R can be an imaginary number. Uh, you know, on, upon some round trip, there could be some, some phase in addition to some, some amplitude change. But uh, I'm, I'm, gonna be a, I'm not gonna worry about the, the complex nature of R. Uh, so much for now. So, um, okay. So let's let's consider modes that that fit in the cavity, the same kind of modes we saw before. And so, uh, 
sorry, we're, we're not going to worry about uh, an integer number of modes that fit in the caveat. We're just going to ask as you go around uh, here, I'm not going to consider phase changes from uh, from the mirrors themselves. I'm just going to consider the phase, the overall phase that gets accumulated as you take this round trip. And so uh, this means that I'm going to assume assume that all the phase comes from the round trip, and that R itself is is going to be uh, a, a real number. And, and all that's going to do if, if we if we generalize that, it's going to shift things around a little bit, but it's not going to change qualitatively what this looks like. So let me write this not in terms of magnitudes, but in terms of the actual quantities here. So e e of n plus one is going to equal r times this round trip phase e to the i uh, times k times two d. That's how much phase gets accumulated as you go uh, a distance d and a distance d again times e e n plus. And now what we want to do is we want to say, if, if we had some, some wave in here, what we actually get is we get E total is E naught plus E after one round trip plus E after two round trips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all E plus. And, and we, can, we can do this sum because, uh, because of this simple form here. And remember that if you have uh, if you have a sum that looks like this, so one plus x plus x squared plus dot dot dot, if you just call this s, uh, maybe let me call it s on this side. If you call that s, as long as the magnitude of x is less than one, the sum converges. And I can calculate what this is by saying, well, what is x, x times s? Let me write that, but let me write it, shift it over. So this is going to be x plus x squared plus dot, 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 dot. And then I can subtract these two. So this minus that is one minus x times s equals just one on this side. So I can solve for s. s equals one over one minus x. So you've probably seen that uh, a bunch of times, but let's, let's apply that here because e0 is just e0. e1 is e0 times one of these and as long as the magnitude of R is less than one, as long as we really do have losses, uh, this, this, will, uh, this will converge. And then E2 is two of those, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have, we have something that looks like this. Okay, so let me write that more explicitly. E0 times one plus R e to the I two KD plus R squared e to the I four KD plus dot, dot, dot. So so x here is just this, and uh, and I can use my sum formula to, to calculate what this what this infinite sum is, as long as we really do have losses. So let me write that. So this is just e naught plus over one minus r e to the i. 2kd, uh, that's it. Okay, so that's the electric field. Let me, let me start erasing a little bit more. Let's ask about what the magnitude is. So the magnitude is the magnitude squared, sorry, the, the intensity. Uh, the intensity is the magnitude squared of this electric field times some, some overall constants like that one over eta that we don't, don't normally worry about because we just want to just want shapes, shapes of things rather than uh, absolute quantities. So let me say that E, that I intensity is proportional to you know, some, some constant with the right dimensions, proportional to the magnitude of E squared. And so this is um, some, some constant so, so this, this thing in the denominator has, has no dimensions. So let me just say that this, this is just some, some constant with units of intensity over this thing squared. So the magnitude of one minus R e to the I two KD, all that magnitude squared. 
And if I were to take this and multiply it by its complex conjugate and use the same, uh, the same Euler's formula stuff as I did before, this has a pretty simple form. It's just I naught over, uh, I'm gonna run out of room, damn it. All right, let me give myself some more room here. Uh, okay, so, so this, this is gonna be equal to up here, uh, I naught over the following thing, which is one, one minus R squared plus four R sine squared of KD. Okay, so as a function of D, where, where does the maxima, where are the maxima of this, of this function? Uh, the maxima happens when the denominator is minimum. And this is a positive number and uh, R, we're just taking it as a positive, positive uh, sort of reflection constant, you know, like 0.99 or 0.999. And so uh, the maxima of this whole thing happen where sine squared is, is minimal or sine squared is, is zero. And so the maxima happen at exactly the same point as our resonant condition before. We get some spikes here. And, uh, and, and what, what, is, what is the maximum? Well, the maximum happens when sine squared is zero. So I max, I max is I naught over one minus R squared. And usually you can measure the, measure the maximum. So you, you change the length of this cavity with some knob and you can measure, measure the maximum intensity. And so it helps to write things in terms of a ratio of a maximum intensity. So let me do that. Erase some stuff here. And in a little bit, as soon as I do that and I define some terms, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plot it. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So just with, with this definition of I max, this just becomes I max over, so you can imagine uh, dividing top and bottom by one, uh, one over one minus R squared. So this, this is one minus some, pre some factor that multiplies sine squared of KD. And uh, you can work out what, what, this, what this prefactor is and I will in a second, but uh, it's given a name and the name looks a little bit complicated. It's two, two script F. So it's like a capital cursive F over pi squared. And uh, script F here is, if you sort of went through this math and divided top and bottom by, by all this stuff, this is pi square root of R over one minus R. So it looks like we introduced a pi here just to just to cancel it out there. But writing future quantities in terms of in terms of this script F is gonna make our lives a little bit easier. And this this quantity is called the finesse of the cavity. And this is uh, I don't know, kind of one of these weird optics, optics terms that you know sort of vaguely, vaguely French. Um, and if, uh, well, you can imagine that uh, you want, uh, you want high finesse cavities, right? Finesse is sort of a good word. Um, and when R is, is, uh, is very close to one, Right, so imagine R is 0.99. So 99% of the light gets reflected back and forth. 
then one minus R is 0 0.01. And that, that multiplies this F by a, when you bring that up into the numerator, it multiplies F by a big, a big number. So the better the cavity is, the higher the, the finesse. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot, uh, I'm gonna plot this, um, well, I'm gonna make one more substitution, which, which is just to turn, to turn K into a frequency. So uh, let me go back and, and remember that K, K was, um, where do I wanna start? Okay, two, K was two pi over lambda. And if I wanted to turn lambda into a frequency, lambda was C over F. So, so K is just two pi um, nu, the frequency over C, the speed of light. And uh, the, the free spectral range, that delta nu that we saw before, so uh, delta nu, or sometimes called the free spectral range, this was equal to two, I wanna make sure I don't screw that up here. I see, yeah, C over 2D. So this was the spacing here. So if I wanted to write, not in terms of, uh, not in terms of D, but in terms of the, the free spectral range, I could, I could plug, plug these definitions in and I'll write it in terms of frequency and in terms of uh, delta frequency, in terms of free spectral range. And when I do that, I get my, my final expression that I'll plot and talk about a little bit in terms of these, these two new things, the, the finesse, which, which has to do with the reflectivity of the cavity and the free spectral range, which has to do with the, the distance. So let me come down here. Sorry, my board management with this tiny board is not as, not as convenient. It's on a big chalkboard, IMAX over one plus two times the finesse over pi squared times the sine of, well, there's, the twos are gonna cancel, the pi is gonna stay. So it's pi times nu over delta nu, the free spectral range. And, uh, and that's pretty nice. So now every time, every time nu is an integer multiple of the free spectral range, we get, we get a, a maximum. Uh, but if I were to actually plot this, so let me, let me plot this whole thing for different values of the finesse. And where do I wanna plot it now? Okay, so, so now that you're sophisticated op optics people, we will not think in terms of lambda anymore when we consider cavities, we'll think always in terms of uh, in terms of new and free spectral range. So let me make a sim similar plot to this, but for an actual cavity with some finite reflectivity. And uh, if, if F equals 10, I think is a good example, you get, you get the plot that looks pretty spiky. It looks like this, if I just plot, plot it out. So if this is, this goes up to some I, I max. So this is the intensity that's, that, uh, that exists in the cavity as a function of, of nu. And the spacing is still the free spectral range spacing, delta nu, between these, these spikes. Um, so this, this, is for, this is for F, the finesse equals 10. Sorry, it's not showing up super well. Um, so this is sort of, you know, if you think about it in terms of uh, uh, R's here, this is probably, you know, somewhere around a 99% reflective cavity. But if I, if I were to go to a, a worse cavity, say one where F was, was two, then this, these spikes would look a lot less sharp. There would still be maxima here, but they would just sort of look more like sine waves. And then all, all these would just go on, on and on forever. So this, this one would be for a, for a finesse of, of two. 
And as you make R better and better and better, so you go from 99% reflective to 99.9, 99.99% reflective, the finesse gets higher and higher and higher, and these spikes become sharper and sharper and sharper. And what's happening here is that at the spikes, you're getting constructive interference. You're getting an integer number of, uh, of wavelengths coming back. But the constructive interference isn't perfect because every time you go round trip, you're, you're losing a little bit. Uh, in between, you're getting destructive interference, but unlike in this case where you sort of reflect an infinite number of times and you get complete destructive interference after enough round trips, um, here, if you're off, off resonance of the cavity, um, depending on the quality of the cavity, depending on the finesse of the cavity, uh, you, you lose amplitude, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't go down to zero. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're only reflecting 1% uh, of the light, then your, your destructive interference isn't perfect. It, or sorry, if you're, if you're reflecting 99% of the light, your destructive interference isn't perfect. You're left with 1% left. And that's sort of what, what happens with this finesse of, of, uh, of 10 cavity. OK, so, so uh, next time we're going to analyze the, the question which you may have been wondering, which is how do you get light into and out of these cavities? And, and for that, we're, we're going to con continue with this R. Um, we're going to treat one of the mirrors as mostly reflective, but semi-transparent. So if you coat a mirror with, with metal and the, the coating is not very thick, um, it, you can still see, see through it a little bit. Uh, and that's how light is going to get into these cavities and get out of these cavities. And, uh, and we'll analyze that. We'll analyze cavities with curved mirrors and ask what are the valid modes for those cavities. And hence, it's going to be Gaussian, Gaussian modes. But then we have to consider curved cavities with uh, finite reflectance. And, uh, and finally, we'll, we'll actually consider filling the, the inside of the cavity with some gas and exciting the gas and, and having it emit. And uh, when it emits light, uh, the reason why lasers have such sharp, sharp spikes in frequency is that the gas naturally emits light in some wide spectrum. But um, if you have a very high finesse cavity, unless that light emitted in that wide spectrum lines up with one of the cavity modes, um, it, it destructively interferes. And the quantum part of the lasers is that uh, an atom is in an excited state and there's a little bit of uncertainty. And so the, the, the spectrum that it could emit is, is rather broad. But quantum mechanics says that uh, because light is a is a boson, it ends up being a higher probability to emit light into a mode where there is already a lot of light present. And so uh, that's that's what actually gives us our, our lasing action, is light being emitted into, into modes where there is already a lot of light. And so uh, the, the light will tend to pick, pick one or two of these modes, one or two of these spikes, that's within its natural width and dump all of its light in, in there. And the, the higher the finesse the cavity, the, the sharper the spectrum of the light coming out can be. But when you analyze laser light, and how do you do that? Well, you do it with another cavity somewhere else. When you analyze laser light, um, you'll see that you get a couple of these spikes. You get a comb of frequencies, and it depends on the combination of how broad the natural natural uh, width of the atomic excitation is. And it also depends on how good your, your cavity is, how high, high finesse your cavity is, and how stable your cavity is. If, if the cavity itself is vibrating a little bit or slowly thermally expanding or contracting, these, these spikes are going to move around a little bit. Uh, all right, so there's maybe two minutes left. I, will, uh, I, can, I can take any questions about this sort of having laid out a, a plan for where we're going in the next couple of days. Um, if you want to see this in action, you can watch 
the video that I uploaded called Lab 4C. Um, I don't I don't think I explicitly asked you to look at it yet, but uh, if you want a preview of sort of where uh, where where this is going and how to look at the spectrum of lasers with the spectrum of a laser cavity with a second analysis cavity. Um, I, I have filmed myself in lab doing that, although I don't I don't love that video mostly because the lighting was was really bad. You can't really see what's going on in the oscilloscope very well. But I might try to go do that again. But uh, all right. Any questions about this? If not, maybe I'll let you go a minute early and I'll see you on Friday. All right, bye. Thank you.